Live streaming is on. Okay. So, um, so welcome everybody to the part two of our discussion on Marcus Aurelius. Um, uh, we spoke at length last week, which I think was a really good, at least, introduction to Marcus Aurelius. Several of us had a few good um, quotes we pulled out um, from the book, and I'd like to continue that, but also maybe deep dive into some specific questions that broadly analyze or contradict or um, ask ourselves, um, what do we think about his work and you know, about his um, profession of Stoic philosophy? Um, and um, our tacit assumption of, or a tacit assumption of um, accepting some of the points he makes um, um, and how we can apply some of these teachings into our lives, um, I think are, are some of the some of the next steps we can make in, in discussing his work. Um, a couple of announcements just to reiterate something on Telegram, so for all those watching too. Um, uh, Next week, I'm taking a hiatus, so there won't be a, a, a meeting next week um, because I, I, first of all, I need a break. The next few weeks are um, big um, weeks of exams and review with my students, and I just needed a little bit of extra time and space for that. Um, I also need a little bit of extra time to prepare for the next, I think, I guess, um, next reboot of the Berlin Stoics group. Um, I've been kind of disillusioned, not with the group or stoicism, but with the way in which the group is going. The group has pretty much been a very stable, at a very stable place since its inception in August last year, um, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think it's grown. I think it's um, it's obviously been heard a lot. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten this this email from Kai Whiting. Um, uh, it's, you know, um, or Dan wouldn't, wouldn't have made his, um, his contribution to presenting to us. I think there's, so they, it's really picked up um, in the stoic world. Um, but I, I've kind of felt disillusioned in the sense of we, we kind of do the same old and same old. And I think there's a way in which we can reboot the group in a way that, that really, um, uh, um, plays to our interests. Um, there is some, there will be, there will likely be maybe two meetups at most a week in frequency because there are different kinds of meetups I anticipate having, um, for example, I will definitely maybe distinguish different meetup events between those for beginners and those for maybe intermediate level uh, stoic members, because um, especially for all of us here who might find it boring to rehash the same principles. Um, for instance, um, last week was really, really helpful for the new members. There was like, I think there were four or five of them. So it was really, really helpful to really rehash some of those basic principles because they needed that. Um, but at the same time, for the others of us here, um, it kind of gets, while repetition may be something we can speak about in terms of Marcus Aurelius is useful and necessary for Stoic practice. It's not something I don't think we would like to do weekly here for two hours. It's just not necessary. Um, so I definitely want to distinguish between those events, those discussion meetups that are um, for beginners and those discussion meetups that are for intermediate level people who know enough about stoicism that they can more deep dive into it. Um, so that, um, uh, which um, is not necessary, I think, but at least helps to filter out those who would like to come into the Berlin Stoics, but who still need an introduction. So they wouldn't, they would stop themselves from coming to the intermediate meetups and kind of funnel themselves into the beginning of a one meetups. Um, and that's the whole intention. And then they can kind of slowly after they, um, I'll make a few points, after they come to a f maybe one or two introductory meetups, they can start coming to some other meetups that involve applications or practices of, of stoicism. Um, so they know the basics. Um, and another distinction, another division between some of the meetups might be between, um, I know two or three of us, I don't think many, but I think a couple of us have mentioned we would really like to understand the academic side of stoicism, or at least peer into the the, the academic world um, that is studying and researching stoicism. Um, uh, but there's also a huge, huge, huge um, following of stoicism for its practical applications. Um, and it's um, uh, it's applying the principles in our own lives. Um, and those would be more workshop styled um, 
uh, less discussion based, less based on text. I, I, so there would be a big distinction between the academic discussions, which we, I think, usually have. Although we have discussions about applications, sometimes those, ap those discussions are still based on texts. I really want to make a distinction between those events that are based on text, that are based on new information, that are based on research, that are based on academic discussions, versus those that are based on practicing stoicism and actually doing something in, in like a workshop style um, setting. Um, which is going to be a bit difficult. I have to um, I have to kind of think about and do some research on how to model this online because I think it's a little bit easier in person. I think online we ha I have to um, uh, find a way in which um, I don't think it would be as long. I don't think that it would be a two hour workshop. I think the 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 time frames in which these ev events will would will um, pass will be a bit different. Um, they won't necessarily be a full two hours and they won't necessarily be on Saturdays. Sometimes they'll be on Saturdays. And I think sometimes if there's two meetups a week, depending on the type of meetup it is, it might be during the week as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, that's it. That's, that's the only announcement I had. Um, uh, and the reason behind my, my one week I hit us next week. Um, so without, without further ado, um, let's dive into the meditations. Um, I am in book eight right now. I still haven't finished it, um, but I, I should be finished in the next few days. But I, I really went through um, a lot more. Um, there's a huge, huge section of notes at the end, which I'm really, really thankful for, um, which if I haven't read the Inner Citadel yet, at least put some context and some analysis into it. Um, depending on um, the references Marcus Aurelius makes. Um, last week, I started with the, the, just a very basic question about um, what from the meditations would you like to point out as your, let's say, main thematic mantra that you would take into your life? Um, uh, what's uh, one quote or one passage that you would, that you would prefer um, to take and remember if you didn't remember anything else from the meditations, um, which I think we can begin with if you would like, but I also have a corollary to that question to maybe not make it so simple um, or not not start out such a blank slate. Um, and I have a presentation here, um, a working presentation here. Um, ready for us because I was in the middle of writing a quote as I was um, uh, as I was doing this um, but how about I share my screen so that you can see this quote as I'm reading it so I can begin maybe with this one quote and a good question based on that um, that we can begin with um, application when yeah there it is Okay, can everybody see my screen? Can everybody see this presentation? Okay, um, I'm gonna try and enlarge it um, now. Maybe I can take this away. Okay, uh, so this is, um, I'll preface it with, this is the introduction to book five. Um, this is book five, one. This is the very first passage. Um, and I'll get to my question in a second. If I just keep typing, uh, and I can keep typing after I read the passage. So I'll read the passage, I'll ask my question, I'll say a few words, and then I'll open it up for discussion. Um, and then I'm gonna continue typing the quote in so we can read it in full. This, by the way, this translation is a, 20, um, a 2014 publication from Penguin Classics. Um, if you're, so, so you know the translation is not coming from one of the online editions. It's also not coming from the Christopher Gill edition. It's coming from a 2014, um, uh, Peng Penguin Classics edition. It states, um, and I'll paraphrase because it's, it's long. Um, At break of day, when you were reluctant to get up, have this thought ready to mind. I am getting up for a man's work. Do I still then resent it if I'm going out to do what I was born for, the purpose for which I was brought into the world? Or was I created to wrap myself in blankets and keep warm? But this is more pleasant. Were you then born for pleasure, all for feeling, not for action? Can you not see plants, birds, ants, spiders, bees, all doing their own work, each helping in their own way to order the world? Um, but nature has set limits to this too, just as it has to eating and drinking, and you yet go beyond these limits, beyond what you need. Not in your actions though, not any longer. Here you stay below your capability. 
Um, the reason why I, I, I put this passage, oh, and I underline, the, I underline the end of it. It says, yet these people, when impassioned, he talks about the people kind of antithetical to the sage. He says, yet these people, when impassioned, give up food and sleep for the promotion of their pursuits. So he mentions people like exhibitionists, dancers, metal workers, people who work. Um, they give up food and sleep for the promotion of their pursuits. And you think social action less important, less worthy of effort. And the reason why I mention this is because it's a, it's kind of, it, 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 it is a very different direction in which you think it ends up going. Um, the reason why I mention this is because Stoicism is usually painted as a very individualistic philosophy. Um, it's, it's painted as, um, I think you can kind of take it out of context. If I just read the first line, at break of day, when you are reluctant to get up, have this ready, have this thought ready to mind, I'm getting up for a man's work. And that sounds like if you take that out of context, it doesn't sound stoic. It really doesn't. It just it sounds like a um, uh, um, a a philosophy or a mantra that somebody who still believes or still follows this um, uh, old conservative masculine esque um, uh, um, ideology. Um, I'm getting up for a man's work. Um, perhaps the translation is correct. I don't know what other translations you guys also have. Um, but um, the the reason why I think in context is, it, first of all, it makes a lot more sense. Second of all, it takes a completely different turn than you think, because you still think it kind of continues on this individualistic trajectory. But the whole rationale for getting up in the morning, taking action, um, doing what you know needs to be done, fulfilling your purpose, practicing the virtues, has actually nothing to do about your own individual interests. His entire rationale for this is social action. Um, it's, it's, it's the fact that you're part of the whole. He continues, at least in this translation, he refers to it as the whole, the, this logos, this, this encompassing tapestry that everything is interconnected and kind of helping to maintain this whole order of the universe. Um, and that's his rationale for this, for getting up in the morning and make, taking action that you would like to and fulfilling your purpose is that um, you, you, the plants, birds, and spiders, beads, he says, are basically doing their own work without complaining. Um, they're doing it in order to contribute to the world and contributing to nature. So why are you complaining? Why are you doing this? Um, I, I think this is one of the few passages also um, that... Um, and I don't think Marcus Aurelius was, was ever good at um, conveying, um, uh, what's the word, um, compassion towards yourself. Um, I think there's other Stoic philosophers that do it better, but I think Marcus Aurelius was a much more hardened person to himself. He, I don't think chastise is a good word, but I think he definitely um, um, uh, um, kind of attacked himself personally. Like he, he really wanted to be hard on himself. He really was basically talking to himself and saying, what are you doing? Stop um, languishing in your bed. Stop languishing under the covers. Because there's, there's another one, there's another um, passage that talks about um, why are you, why are you staying in bed? Keep, you know, get up and, and do this. Um, and, um, but then he turns and, and talks about contributing to the social order. It's contributing to the whole, contributing to this, to this, this purpose of, of actually doing some social action. Um, and he never mentions of a rationale to kind of fulfill oneself. Um, and I think there is, there is a sense in the rest of his philosophy that you need to practice the virtues and, and better yourself. But this specific passage opens up book five. So it kind of sets the whole theme for it. Um, I had no particular question um, other than what would you personally, um, I, th I think we can maybe ask ourselves this, um, what is your motivation? Like, would you take this? Would you criticize this as something that's not per perhaps not personal to you, not um, personally motivating to you? Um, is this motivating enough? Like, do you get up in the morning and say, I have to do this for the greater good. I have to do this because somebody else depends on me. Um, and I ask this because I think it might be a little bit contradictory to some other 
in a very strict sense, contradictory to some of the more basic, some of the more strict stoic tenets that you do things only because they're inherently good, because they're inherently good for you and for your virtues. But this is very different. It's almost like asking yourself to commit to social action because it's um, uh, it's good for the whole. It's it's good. Um, it's almost like getting up in the morning and saying somebody else depends on me. Um, and I'll make this last comment before I, I stop my spiel that um, I, I do this sometimes when I'm actually getting up for teaching. Um, when I feel so tired in the morning after the week, maybe on Thursday or Friday, and I say to myself, but my students are sitting there in class and they're waiting for me. So I have to get up and I have to go to them. Um, and I'm wondering if this is a bit anti-Stoic. Is there, is there a kind of anti-Stoic element in this that I am depending on their waiting for me, their dependence or their reliance on me to help them? Am I depending on this? Is that an anti-Stoic motivation? Or is there, um, is, 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 am I still able to rationalize that by saying, or in a, in a kind of unethical way, rationalize that by saying I'm doing this for the greater good? Um, okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, before before I get to your question, I just want to uh, say that this is also one of the uh, my favorite passages, um, and um, I've never really viewed it in the same light. So it's interesting to hear um, your um, your take on it. But now that you kind of elaborate um, on it, it actually does uh, make sense. This idea that it's slightly um, at odds with the um, at least the turn that it takes towards the end at odds with um, uh, stoic ideals. Um, the part uh, that I um, that I used the most, most the one that I get the most um, out of, is the passage about um, the where is where it starts about um, talking about exactly the plants, the birds, the ants, the spiders. Uh, so much so that for a long time I actually used this in my morning meditation. Um, so I um, I used to sit and just you know calm down and and find a way and um, get into a good uh, calm space. And I would picture actually the early morning, um, the sun coming up and um, all the ants and birds and bees and spiders coming to life right? being woken up by the um by the rising of the sun and how they would um do as their nature um uh beckoned let's say as their nature demanded right there's no um i couldn't imagine a bee um getting up in the morning and saying to itself like Oh, I don't. I don't want to collect honey today. Today, I want to do, you know, whatever. It's not natural to the bee to uh, question it. And I would then um, kind of take from there, um, try to try to remind myself of having the same attitude that um, just as the ants and birds and spiders and bees are doing what is natural to them, um, so I should in the same way um, do what is natural to me as a rational human being which is um yeah um so um i really relate to to um this quote maybe the slightly different part but um to um to come to your um question about whether it is um maybe a little bit unstoic um that um and it, it also relates to the harshness that you alluded to um that you have to do something for somebody else and i think you're right i think actually um it's like i said it's not something that occurred to me before but i think you're right it is um a little bit at odds with the stoic idea of you do things because they're right not because you have to um and maybe to some degree it is um because of his unique situation um as the emperor that um he was just constantly um surrounded by um like he also reminded himself you know people that wanted something of him and 
having to, to, to do things that he did not want to do. Um, so I, yeah, I think you're right. I think I can, can see this in there, definitely. I was also thinking that um, there might be um, uh, not a quick solution, but a kind of um, a kind of compromise between the philosophy and this kind of unstoic attitude of depending on other people to uh, of the reliance on your, your hard work to motivate you. That I think um, perhaps this is not something that he says, and I can't find a passage in here. I don't remember ever reading a passage like this, but perhaps the compromise is that in the short term, as you're practicing and training yourself to the virtues, um, perhaps this is useful motivation. You know this is worthy for so of social action, of contributing to others. Um, but in the long term, you become a bee. You become an ant. You become a, a, another animal. Because, in, because over the course of a long period of time, it becomes habit to get up and do things for other people. So it becomes less, less a dependence or motivation to do things for other people. And more over time, just part of your nature to just get up and do it. So perhaps that's... Perhaps there's kind of a sacrifice of a short-term unstoic motivation and a long-term making that long-term habit because you know that in the short term, you're not starting from the point of a sage. You're starting from the point of somebody working up to a sage. So you know you have to make some kind of interim sacrifices to work your way up there. Um, uh, Shakam. Yeah, that's also one of my favorite uh, quotes and you know, getting up in the morning, it's the hardest thing uh, you do uh, during the day. <laughs> Just uh, this motivation um, that would uh, guide and, you know, enable all the other actions of the day. Um, and this is, I think, the biggest uh, change and biggest shift in, in activity from sleep to uh, to waking up and and starting the day um, i see the a passage about uh, the little uh, plants uh, birds and ants and spiders um they have their work and we have our work and so when the bee uh, wakes up and thinks about uh, the flowers uh, that are waiting uh, for her, uh, it's, you know, it's her duty to to help them. I don't see it um, it's any difference from uh, getting up and helping uh, children. Then it's your job as a as a bee. Yeah, um, it's uh, it also doesn't help that we um, I think we make because as I'm moving and I just finished moving completely, so now I'm sitting in my own my new apartment. As as I was moving, um, and I'm searching for things online to order and, and buy, I noticed that um, uh, f there there are certain things that you just don't need. For example, when I was buying something off of uh, eBay, eBay Kleinanzeigen, and I go to this person's home, and they actually show me other things. I know I'm, I'm buying something from them. I think it was a, um, I because I, I really like used, buying used items. I buy a a, a trash can, um, or I buy I'm buying a shelf from them that they have laying around, um, and they then they come to me with certain things like a um a. Uh, one person said, "Oh, I'm also selling this. A um, it's like a tr it's like a morning breakfast tray where you might bring to somebody or you bring to yourself, and you serve breakfast on it while they're sitting in bed." And I just mentioned that because it's it's almost like we've we've made some parts of our lives too comfortable where we don't want to get up in the morning. And so I looked at that and I said, yeah, that's definitely not necessary. <laughs> if I buy that, I know my girlfriend and I are not going to leave the bed. We're just going to sit in there, eat breakfast and, 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 and lay in there on a lazy Sunday. And it's a Sunday, but it's not something I want to do for the entire day. And I don't want to sit in there for breakfast. You know, I want to be mobile. And um, I think not buying that or maybe not 
accommodating yourself with like, I don't have a nightstand. I don't, so I, don't, I can't put anything really next to my bed. I think, you know, you can't, you don't have to sacrifice a bed for yourself, but sacrificing those other little discomfort, those are little, a little, a little yeah, other little comforts um, that kind of help um, uh, accessorize your, your morning or your sleep um, could help maybe in the long term. I think a good strategy might be practicing these discomforts. Um, uh, you, I don't know, you, you, you said something because yeah, it was Shakam who really emphasized the fact that, yeah, I really have a big problem waking up in the morning. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I think it's because sometimes you just have some of these um, luxuries that you really don't need. I think there's a sense of minima, there's a sense of, um, uh, what's the movement called? Um, it escapes me now. Um, minimalization, um, this idea that um, to an extent we should just minimize those discomfort, those, those comforts um, to increase a little bit of discomfort or at least at least kind of lessen the comforts um, so that you, you're not um, you're not immobile, you're not inactive. Yeah, it was my favorite. I think I think of all, and I actually don't see it quoted too often. I see other passages quoted more often, but this this I don't see quoted too often. But it was my favorite out of everything I've read so far. This is something I said to myself: I can I can write this down, jot it down, put it on the side. This would be the one thing I have on the side of my bed every morning, and I could look at this every morning. And this this would be something that I think can really motivate me to kind of. Um, if I'm, if, if, if it's just one of those days, I can, I can read and really get myself up. Um, Tony. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting concept. Um, I just think my own situation and I do work, which I quite dislike. Um, and I struggle with that pretty much every day. Um, but I think there's an, an inherent sense of duty. Um, in our lives as adults, as we grow older, um, particularly when we have children, that the choice to not participate in a particular work activity or whatever is taken away naturally because there are people who depend upon us. Um, and yet I, I know that I have a choice. You know, I could walk away from my job. I could walk away even from my family. That's a choice. But I choose not to do that. And... I think it's an interesting contrast between our free will, what we're able to do and what we choose to do, even if it causes us discomfort in some way. Um, so I'm just interested to know your views on, you talk about discomfort. It's not only sort of physical discomfort, but also maybe mental, psychological, spiritual discomfort also, which we, we all must um, take upon our shoulders on a continual basis. Yeah. Uh, I, I do have something to say, but I, I wanted to kind of take maybe a, a minute just to see if somebody else wanted to start off and respond to Tony's um, Tony's inquiry. Um, but I, I will say maybe just to just to begin with, there is a um, there is a sense of uh, um, as much as the Stoics pride like talk about fate and providence a lot. They talk about destiny, and so one might think that they don't really believe in free will or they don't believe you have too much will i think they i think they there's there's a sense of, there's a sense of compatibilism in philosophy this there's compatibilism is that belief that free will and determinism can coexist in 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 the world um and i think the stoics would kind of fit in that camp because there's just too much in the meditations that make makes me and other and, and everybody else i think believe that he really did believe that what you think and what you believe you can do and what you will and what you choose to do, you can do as long as you really choose to do it and you do it. Um, uh, I think that also you're saying something deeper and I, I don't think you said this explicitly, but I really think you came close to it when, when you opened it up with saying that you like to remind yourself in the morning, you have a choice and you're going to make this choice to get up and, and serve other people or help other people or do your job. Um, because um, if you're forced to do something, often you resent it. You know, you, you, you resent what you're forced to do. But whenever you have, whenever somebody makes it voluntary to do, um, 
and you you have a free will to choose or not choose to do it and then you choose to do it it kind of great gives you a it grants you a greater sense of agency you have a greater sense of self-efficacy afterwards because you you really believe that you can do it afterwards and you you chose to do it willingly which also indicates to you that you you've kind of reached this higher sense of virtue like you've really empowered yourself you took the courage to do it you in you did yourself more self-discipline um you yourself made a wise choice and you um you're making a just choice to help others so it kind of yeah i, I think because it's not just the choice it's the fact that it's voluntary it's the fact that you have that free will that agency and you chose to do it it's a really good point you make um yeah that was that, that was my point <laughs> Um, and uh, if, if nobody else had, um, Shakam, I didn't know if, if you wanted to say something. I thought you, I might have interrupted you. Uh, yeah, but I uh, completely forgot the uh, kind of thought. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I put it as a quote from uh, the start of uh, book nine. For since the universal nature has made rational animals for the sake of one another to help one another according to their deserts, but in no way to injure one another. He who transgresses uh, her will is clearly clearly guilty of a uh, impiety towards the highest uh, divinity. Hmm. And so I think we are made. I mean, you know, by evolution and such, uh, to be social. And we have the, the opportunity to, to define our, our circles, um, to define uh, ourselves and uh, uh, our friends and um, you know, some parts we can choose not the family that we came from, but family uh, we are building. So it is a choice. And if uh, if we act according to this nature that uh, makes us uh, social and helpful to others, then, yeah, I say, I don't see it as a very complicated decision, but it is a decision and it's good to uh, remind ourselves. You, uh, you do make a point though. I mean, it's, it's a choice, but it's like a choice. Um, uh, I don't know if you're, anybody's familiar with um, Jean-Paul Jean -Paul Sartre's uh, philosophy a bit um and uh his his treatise he talked about um um he being a nothingness he talked about um freedom and free will and uh there's a good example of you're standing at a cliff and the um you have no way off the cliff um, other than jumping. But if you don't jump, you survive. You, you're just standing on the cliff. Um, and the point most people make is that you have no choice. You're just dead. You're, you know, you're, you're just, but he, his point is that you do have a choice. You can jump. <laughs> and so I think it's that kind of choice where for this, for the stoic is that, you know, if you're choosing between making the choice to get up in the morning and, and do something in the interest of your virtue, do something in the interest of justice and, 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 um, uh, then there, then there really is no other choice because you're, you're choosing between reason and unreason of, of justice and injustice. And so if you, if you choose injustice, well, then <laughs> uh, you're, you're that kind of person the stoic might actually shame. Um, but um, 
uh, so it's a choice. You're right. It's a, it's a choice, but not really a choice because it's an obvious choice. And if, um, uh, I think that's also maybe where Marcus Aurelius gets his own self shame from where he, sometimes he's very critical of himself. He might, he might seem like that because he really believes that why, like he kind of hits and hit, I, I feel like he might hit himself over the head sometimes because he just, Sometimes if he doesn't do something in accordance with nature or in accordance with his virtues, he might, he might start writing down. I could just imagine him writing down in his journal saying, why are you doing this? You know, what, just, just, just do it. Just do what you need, what needs to be done. Um, I think also at the end of the quote you mentioned, he says, is clearly guilty of impiety towards the highest divinity, which might have uh, more context in the sense in, 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 in terms of the gods for for him and his his contemporaries but i think there's a good kind of metaf uh, philosophical translation we can make that whenever i read him saying the divinity i always think of character i think of when i think of divinity he always talks about inner divinity in us and whenever he says that i always read that as saying our kind of virtuous or unvirtuous character so if you're ever transgressing against your against nature or your own will, what you're doing is kind of kind of blemishing your character. Um, that's how I've always read it as, which is the same thing as what you're saying before. Like there's there's really no choice. You're either making the choice to make your character more inte have integrity, or or you're running against that. Um, I think this is one of my favorite uh, quotes. Um, and it's about seeing things for what they, are, they truly are without um, your desires, um, the, say, the appearances, um, just plain and simple. When we have meat before us and such eatables, we receive the impression that this is the dead body of a fish and this is the dead body of a bird or of a pig. And again, and then this type of wine is only a little grape juice and this purple robe, some ship's wool, dyed with the blood of a shellfish. Um, and I think going, living life with this reminder, um, because, I don't know, people can uh, see a brand new shiny car and attach it to, to it all their dreams about social standing uh, and uh, the, the envy of, uh, of everybody around them. But it's a bit of metal that expels fumes. It's not the social standing. It's not um, a riches. It's just a bit of metal. It's really easy to get uh, um, lost in temptation and, and passions. And I think this is a strong, um, strong reminder. Also, uh, Zeno's uh, ship that uh, um, got wrecked and uh, started uh, this whole uh, philosophy uh, carried uh, the blood of the shellfish uh, from uh, um, from uh, Phoenicia. Uh, so it's, a <laughs> it's like uh, within story connections. That's a um, that's a really odd detail that we know about his history. <laughs> of all the things we know about the blood of his sheep, but we don't have the record of his works. <laughs> uh, I mean. He was a Phoenician trader. That's mm. their was their main uh, export. Um, 
and uh, I mean, you know, for, for Zeno, I assume it was his whole world, you know, the purple dye uh, that he sold it to the um, uh, Roman uh, nobility and such. And then, uh, like, what, three, wait, three or four hundred, four hundred years later, this young uh, upstart, uh, Marcus says, says uh, that it's worthless. Which I, I think that's the conclusion uh, Zeno uh, uh, came to after the, the rap. So I think it's, yeah. I think um, Zeno was a definite bibliophile as well. It's the first thing he did when he washed up on shore was go to a bookstore. Um, I can imagine you doing that, Steve, actually. <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would, um, I, I, I think you're right. <laughs> um, may, may, maybe I'd have a little bit of water first, uh, if I don't drink too much of the salt water before. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I definitely stro stroll into a bookstore. Um, I'd feel more at home there than at a cafe. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, uh, I was looking at the list uh, of all these commodities that Zeno had on his ship um, and the commodities that uh, Marcus lists here. And I was um, I relate this back to something completely separate because I don't think there's a quote like this in the meditations that about the about this um, about about this principle I want, I want to mention. Um, but I, I'm journaling the other day and I'm journaling about a few different changes I make in my life. Um, um, and I'm, I'm trying to kind of capitalize on top of another and the difficulties I have in making those changes. So way back in years before I started making the change of becoming healthier, I cut down on all fast food. I cook my own food. Then I become vegan. Then I quit things like um, uh, I used to smoke almost daily um, marijuana. And then I, I start quitting that three or four years ago. Um, and I noticed that over time, when you make those changes, um, you need to cut down on those comforts. Um, it becomes easier, and it, this, it, there's this sense of cap, um, uh, uh, not capitalization, accumulation, like the the ease with which you can break off from a comfort, or you can reject a comfort. Like if somebody offers you a drink, or if somebody offers you something that you have tried to stay away from, um, with it doesn't have to be food or drink, but it could be. Um, like a material, like getting something really expensive that you know you really want. Um, rejecting things like that could actually become easier. It does become easier over time. I don't think he necessarily mentions that in this book, this sense of accumulation, but um, at least at least in the first eight books, I can't remember something like that specifically. Um, because I don't think he necessarily mentions the ease or difficulty with which it, it is, it takes to actually do all, like to, to, to refuse a comfort or to, to, to take on a discomfort. He just talks about how it's within reason, within nature, and it, it's a requirement to do it. But I don't think he mentions necessarily that that other part of it, how easy or difficult it is to do something like this. Um, perhaps because he's just hard on himself most of the time. But that, I just wanted to mention this kind of accumulative effect. Um, I kind of helps me because when I reflect on that, then I know that as long as I can, as long as I can get past the first few comforts of and the first difficulty that comes with breaking from them, then I know it just becomes easier in in the long run for the for the other comforts I want to break from or the discomforts I want to add add into me and into my life. Actually, which brings me to just I just wanted to mention so that the first quote when I mentioned the beginning of book five and how a good tactic could be to introduce discomforts or I guess the opposite here would the kind of the other side of the coin here would be removing comforts. Um, he does mention discomforts in this book. I, I have it underlined here. It's book five, section eight, actually. So it's actually quite close to it. Book five, uh, uh, section eight. Uh, he mentioned this, this person often, Asclepius. He mentions him in a few times in the book. Um, he says, just as it is commonly said that Asclepius has prescribed someone horse riding or cold baths or walking barefoot. So we could say that the nature of the whole has prescribed him disease, disablement, loss, or any other such affliction. So he does mention like to introduce these little discomforts, like taking cold baths or walking barefoot in order to kind of be more at peace and accept 
other external discomforts that come to you you can't control. Um, uh, so he, he talks about it in a different context to kind of reduce your expectations or to kind of um, prepare yourself for discomforts. But I, I, I would really still like to, I, I really do like how he mentioned that in book five because I was afraid he wouldn't mention it, but it's a good tactic to use to kind of, um, to help yourself get less, for example, get, get up in the morning or to kind of use that accumulative effect um, to help yourself um, over time accumulate those discomforts and find it easier and easier to include discomforts or, or reject comforts. My Kindle application uh, is going haywire. Uh, so I can't find uh, the the quote, uh, but it was uh, book 10, uh, 29. And it's like, um, something like, if death appeared terrible, because I wouldn't have uh, this um, thing or activity. Um, and that's something Marcus asked uh, himself. Uh, okay, he didn't really like uh, horse races, uh, but um, then you know you can think. Uh, um, what scares me in death, in the nothingness? Is it because I won't be able to uh, visit uh, the chariot races uh, ever again? And then maybe you say, uh, no, church races are not that much uh, high on my list. Does death uh, look uh, terrible because I won't be able uh, to see a loved one? Maybe. And with this exercise, you can get closer and closer to what's really important to you. But I can't find the exact quote. Um, Actually, um, I'm not sure if it's the same. I don't think it's the same quote, but I think it's, um, I do remember it, by the way, just about his, uh, there is a quote about chariot racing. I, I might remember the quote, but there was actually another quote that is kind of has the same theme. I was actually mentioning it, to Marcus it, before. Yeah, it has no chariot racing. I, I just... And it was it was either it was either in his book or the, it was in the um uh i just remember it was perhaps some um, a, a commentary on the book but um I, I was mentioning a quote before the this whole thing this whole meeting began and um it was in book four section 24 and he quotes Dem democritus and his the basic theme of it is that um he says most of what we say and do is unnecessary remove the superfluity and you will have more time and less bother so in every case one should prompt oneself is this or is it not something necessary um he says to apply this in both thought and action and i think it's not exactly correspondent to what you're saying but it's similar um where the more as you said i think it applies in both circumstances where you could um uh the question you're asking is um is something similar actually? Do I really need it? Is this? I think it's kind of two sides of the same same coin. The the question: Do I really need this in my life? Can I live without it? And then the other other kind other kind of question you're asking is: um, uh, Will it do me any harm, or will it will it bother me, or will it annoy me if I if I don't do this, or if I remove this comfort? Um, but they're kind. Of, I think they're both one and the same. I think it's a it's an interesting relationship because what what he's saying is that um, what is necessary for our lives is something that um, we we really can't do without. Like it's something that will bother us. Um, and if it's um, if we meditate on something like going to like if if we end if we end up having to miss a sports game or um, a drink with friends or um, something that is a luxury for us we have every here and then. Um, and if we meditate on the fact that we mm, don't really need it because it's um, uh, because it won't bother us in the end if we do if we do miss it, um, 
I think there's that accumulative factor, um, but it's also saying something, I think, deep, more deeply philosophical. He's saying that there's a kind of an equivalence between what's necessary and what doesn't bother us. Um, or what, sorry, what, what will bother us or what will harm us if we don't have what's necessary. Um, uh, Marcus. Yeah, well, I just wanted to add that what I found interesting about uh, discomforts is the relationship uh, to dopamine and uh, to, to the biological apparatus. Uh, not that I'm but all, not that I'm a biologist or that I claim to understand uh, things, but I'm striving to more uh, understand uh, well the mechanisms behind my actions or the biology behind my actions. And um, well, if discomforts or um, well, wanting the wanting uh, seems to well, co cause dopamine spikes. And uh, which, as far as I understand, it's just another kind of stress that you put your body through. But um, so, it makes sense that the more um, the less uh, less comfort you have, the uh, well, more discomfort can change your um, well. Uh, how do you put it? Um, your resistance levels, so to speak. Your uh, well, your your body adjusts to certain levels, and uh, so well. Uh, yeah i know what you mean there's a um i was um I'm, I'm not sure if in, you 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 um learn this in the same context but um i was learning it in the context of um addiction i was looking through addiction studies and how um uh which before researching it had ever known that um uh um there's um there's a big uh, connection between dopamine and, and opiates in your brain. And whenever you um, uh, whenever you do something pleasurable, something, something that makes you happy, something that you, you your body thinks you need, um, what happens is that dopamine is the kind of the first injection. It kind of is the first precursor to what's going on. It kind of makes your brain ready and eager to, to do or to get whatever you, you're doing or getting. And it could be as simple as um, having ice cream every night, you know, it, or, or to a more all the way to a severe addiction. So it, can, it's, it covers this wide range to a, to an extent. And the opiates are what's released after. It's like that's the sense of pleasure you really feel after you do the pleasure, after you get the pleasure, um, after you get the comfort. And um, it makes sense what you're saying that in the context of that, that it's, um, it, first of all, it's it's all really, really difficult when you're, I mean, the, the fact that opiates are really powerful, maybe really understand why it's hard for people to kind of break from addictions or, dis, or, 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 or these comforts or pleasures. Because um, when you deprive your body of that, it's not so much the dopamine, it's it's the fact that they're, they're, the dopamine is not the thing that your body misses. The dopamine signals to your brain, you're ready to get these opiates. Um, that's what's really harmful to your brain. Um, uh, but over time, you're right, your, your body kind of regulates downward. It kind of brings itself to a new normal when you stop these intro introducing these comforts maybe as frequently or as much as you used to because your body already is at this high level of requiring X amount of opiates and this, this X amount of dopamine. And then your body comes over time to a level where it kind of says, uh, I, I need this much less of, of these substances over time because I'm, you know, this is not, this is not normal for me to have this much. Um, th that's the extent to which I know the neurochemistry. <laughs> so don't take my word on, on the vocabulary, on the description that I'm using, but that's the basic principle that I, that I understand. Um, Shakam. Uh, yeah, I just want to say uh, that um, um, dopamine uh, releases uh, 
with the anticipation for uh, the, the activity, uh, the food, whatever. And when you get this rush, this trigger, this dopamine hit, but then you don't uh, supply the, um, like, uh, like the payout. You don't do the activity. You don't take the uh, drug. You don't eat the, the chocolate. Then um, the brain learns that, um, oh no, like you, you sever the connection between this feeling of excitement and anticipation and the activity. And then um, the thinking about this activity wouldn't excite you as much. Think about eating chocolate, like wouldn't excite you uh, as much and there will be less chance of you doing it. Um, and it's a, how do I say, something we can do is try to um, uh, artificially um, anticipate uh, something uh, good like going for a run or uh, eating uh, eating healthy and with time uh, the behavior will shift um, the way uh, before you thought about uh, chocolate now you think about carrots um, but you know it's it's the same mechanics um, yeah. I'm not saying it's easy to do, I'm just saying it's it's possible. Um, um, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just I want one want, thing uh, uh, to ask. Um, so, Steve, how do you feel about real fatty, juicy steak? <laughs> Do, do you have uh, the same anticipation uh, I assume you had uh, before you went uh, uh, vegan? Because this is like a behavioral change uh, that um, can be really cemented in, in like, you know, the brain uh, reactions to, to stimuli. Um. Actually, uh, so I'll answer your question. Maybe I'll, I'll let Philip. I'll remember the question, but um, maybe I'll let Philip. Because um, uh, I do actually, there's a connection to something else in the meditations. And then, and then I'll continue. I want to, I want to speak to more effect of it. Um, but Philip, uh, do you have something to say? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of uh, make another connection to um, the stoic practice about what you just said uh, about um, um, the um, the first uh, motion or the first impulse of um, whatever you're uh, doing it, you um, this idea of stopping and um, sort of interrogating your um, impulse and see if this is um, you know what you really want and if this is a good healthy um, emotion or an unhealthy passion like the example that you gave about eating. Um, something and replacing chocolate with carrots, for example. Um, it's uh, I found this really useful as a the stoic practice um, of this particular like stopping and interrogating your impulses um, and and modulating my behavior and replacing it. Um, there's a um, so I, I want to say in in, in co there's a, there's a contextual a component of this um and a good quote is like an actually in preceding this the book five book four the beginning is entirely about context he says whatever it is in agreement with nature the ruling power within us takes a flexible approach to circumstances always adapting itself easily to both practicality and the given event so i think it's completely dependent on what you what you want or what you do for example like i when i became not when I became vegan and I stopped eating meat, I um, 
I think what really helped me was in staying away from most things that even feel like me. So why I mentioned context is because let's say you don't really want to be vegetarian. Let's say you used to like the taste and feel of meat. Well, then for you, it's really easy today because what you could do is you could easily substitute. And it still there still is a bit of a difference. I'm, it's been so long since I ate meat. Maybe I can't tell the difference anymore. But for me, um, for, for other people, there might be a case where you can slowly replace the meat with meat like or meat fabricated substances and foods um so for you the context is that what you're doing is um and i guess this is more neurochemical and sense sens sensual that you're you're um replacing the the taste and texture of meat with the taste and texture of something similar that's not meat um and the motivation for it is irrespective i'm just talking about the the behavior the behavioral change you're trying to make um Whereas for me, um, I, I was trying to do this out of environmental concerns and ethical concerns. Um, and so, and the reason why context is also important is because I still like the taste of meat. When I quit meat, it's not like I didn't like the taste of meat. It's not like I didn't like the taste of cheese. Like when I still smell a burger cooking, I get hungry. So I know a lot of vegans kind of find that there is, there's, there's some vegetarians who tell me that that's appalling. And I tell them, well, it's not eth unethical to just say that the taste of meat is good. I like the taste of meat. I just don't eat it. Um, so for me, it's completely contextual. The fact that I didn't quit because of the taste or the, the, the feeling of it. I quit because of something entirely different. And that was a big change. I mean, imagine replacing something as as fatty and juicy as a steak with something as, as hard and something so different as the vegetables and fruits you find. Um, it's it is it is a big change, but it's it's just based on habit. Like what really what really helped me was when I um, when I moved to Berlin, I actually got in the habit of cooking something very regular, almost daily. What I did was I cooked or, or buy daily, depending on how much I had left over. I would cook regularly um, just a, I, I would steam or fry uh, just a, a mixture of, of vegetables um, uh, and, um, and then uh, boil a pot of rice and lentils pretty much almost daily. Maybe I'd have a piece of bread on the side, maybe I'd introduce um, some cold lettuce or tomatoes to kind of add to the add to the side. I'd add some spices or something on top, but it'd pretty much be stable. And what helped me over the long term get used to that kind of, this, this vegan diet was just repetition. It was um, getting into a new routine. Um, but that, again, I mentioned the whole context thing because it's based on, completely based upon what I wanted and how I, how I did it. Um, I think what Philip is saying is something that I never really did too much, actually. With veganism, for, you have to understand, for me, it was very easy. Like, for me, changing my food habits was easy. So it's just, I don't think it's for everybody. But that was what helped me was the when you eat something very regularly, although it's a difficult replacement, if you eat it regularly, your body be, more be quickly becomes used to it because it, it knows it. It's like home. Um, but maybe yeah, maybe Philip can speak to more to effect of, of what he's what he did or what he does. Yeah, I'm in the, actually in the exact same boat as you. Um, so I'm, um, I love the taste of meat exactly like you said. Um, I don't eat it. Um, I, I, so I want to say that like right now my diet is I want to say um, I, I try to eat as vegan as possible. Um, but there's a few things that I find very difficult to replace. Um, so I haven't found maybe the right uh, thing for me just yet. Um, for my girlfriend, um, she became vegetarian before me. And um, for her, it was easy because she couldn't stand it. Um, but for me, it was um, more difficult because I really liked um, the texture and I can't stand tofu. And if, you, if you're vegetarian and you can't stand tofu, and it's, uh, it's easier now. But... Um, yeah, it's it can be quite difficult because a lot of salads and, and stuff um, have either cheese uh, in it or um, 
a lot of uh, if you if you do order takeaway, the vegetarian option is usually um, with tofu. So um, that was challenging um, to always uh, pick the um, the option without meat um, and uh, go for tofu because I can't stand it. <laughs> I really can't. Um, but yeah, this 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 like I said um, in this situation, um, like like I said before in response um, that thinking about why I'm doing it. And I'm, I'm in the same boat. I did it out of um, environmental um, responsibility um, concerns as well. Um, is, um, yeah, like I said, stop uh, the impulse and, and um, think about why you're doing um, what you're doing, what's the motivation behind your actions. Um, and that even if um, maybe, um, you know, uh, one meal where I don't uh, follow my principle, maybe that doesn't, um, you know, have a great impact on on the world. Um, probably it doesn't. Um, but like like it's been said before, um, it is kind of a, a ladder um, that you climb with your habits. Uh, the first step is um, the, is easy. Uh, you keep it up. You can add to the second step and the third step, but um, once you fall, you have to start from the beginning again, and it becomes easy to sort of allow yourself to, um, I don't want to say transgress because it sounds very harsh on yourself, but it is. it does become very easy to um, go back to square one and have to start again from the beginning. Like you miss a day of exercise and the next day you say, oh, well, I already missed one day, or you have to have one cookie that you're not supposed to have and you eat the whole box, uh, those kind of things, I mean. Um, but yeah, uh, like I said, I'm in a, in a very similar, um, boat, um, in a very similar situation as you, Steve, that I still really do like it. And I don't have a craving for it actually anymore. Um, it's just usually, um, when I do eat it, it's maybe once every couple of months, even it's usually circumstantial where I'm in a place where there's just, um, where my dad lives, actually, it's just impossible. There is no vegetarian restaurants. So if we go somewhere. Um, it is, um, yeah, it's, it's just usually not um, not possible. Um, but I don't try to see it as a kind of treat. You know, it's like, oh, it's the one time I'm here, I can I can finally eat some meat. Like, I just try to see it as a, okay, it's circumstantial. I just um, don't have any other option. Um, just a, a short, <laughs> sure, a couple of things for Philip. Um, uh, it's been pretty easy because my, my girlfriend and I both found each other way after we became vegan. So we've been kind of building on each other. Um, just as a tip, seitan tastes a lot better than tofu. Um, <laughs> to, to, tofu is, yeah, to, tofu can be a bit um, uh, blocky, chalky. The, lo the lower quality tofu is really not too good either. Um, seitan works very well. Um, the other thing is, is that, um, so going back to the kind of idea that little discomforts build on each other um, and, and they help you train for the other discomforts in your life is what helped, what helps me, what helps us is slow food. So there's actually, there's actually a, a, an organization in Europe called slow food. And there's this slow food movement where they're trying to get away from people ordering food, doing fast food. They're trying to get people to kind of buy food and cook it more often. So we actually we don't do this too often because it's a lot of work, but we actually make our own seitan about once a month. Um, and so kind of trying to implement these small, small, slow food changes into your life. And whether you're vegan or not, like, honestly, it doesn't, you don't have to become vegan to do this, but introducing slow changes, like eating more organic food or eating slow food, like eating the food that you cook yourself and making the food yourself um, could help or discomforts that help you in other areas of your life. If, if you want to improve your health or improve your diet, whether or not what you, whatever, whatever it is you eat. Um, but especially if you're vegan, that might help you because as a vegan, you're right. There's not a lot of options. If you go out and ask at a restaurant, what's what's vegan for you. But if you make your own food, I found that that's a lot easier. Like for example, the whole vegan cheese problem, you're right. Not a lot of places have it, but you can easily buy the vegan cheese um, from, from a grocery store and then put it into a salad or, or a dish for yourself. Um, 
So, but I found like as as you do other things, that the the main principle that you're trying to stay on is 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 held more uh, at a, at, a, at maybe a higher ladder, a higher step on the ladder. Um, whereas the slow food and the organic part or the other parts are kind of on the lower rain, 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 rungs of the ladder. And, but they kind of help keep that other rung of the ladder high up. Mm -hmm. It's like I, maybe a good analogy. Yeah. Nice. I have to look this up. That sounds very interesting. Thank you for that. And yeah, I know about Satan. Um, and I really like it. And my girlfriend uh, doesn't because it reminds her too much of the texture of me. <laughs> so she actually prefers to I just. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we actually... that's actually something I've heard of before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, it used to be that when I was still eating meat, I would always prepare it on the side and um, just add it in later. And I just kind of weaned off um, in a way of that. And so I was like slowly graduating towards um, eating less meat and then eventually eating none. Um, and uh, now kind of uh, thinking about um, in a similar situation again, where she eats tofu and I eat Satan on the side because I can't compromise on, on the Satan or on, on, the, on the tofu rather. Um. So yeah, <laughs> you know I've heard that before though. It, it tastes it tastes too much like meat. Um, it can be convincing, um, but uh, so I, I wanted I wanted to kind of move slowly away. But there's a um, there's actually a nice I think counterpart to this idea of a, a cumulative effect or ca or capitalization on, on these discomforts. Um, there's kind of the other side of the coin of breaking things down. And I'm trying to find there's actually two passages that Marcus Aurelius gives. One in Book Eleven. And another in, I think maybe book three, actually. Yeah. So he does the, he does this twice, actually. Um, uh, he in book three, eleven, he says. Um, one addition to the precepts already mentioned. Always make a definition or a sketch of what presents itself to your mind. So you can see it stripped bare to its essential nature and identify it clearly in, a, in whole and in all its parts and can tell yourself its proper name and the names of those elements of which it is compounded in and into which it will be dissolved. Nothing is so conducive to greatness of mind as the ability to subject each element of our experience in life to methodical and truthful examination. And then he says something like this again. He says something very similar in Book 11, um, 2. Um, you will think little of the entertainment of song or dance or all in wrestling if you deconstruct the melodic line of a song into its individual notes. Um, and ask yourself of each of them, is this something that overpowers me? Generally then, with the exception of virtue and its workings, remember to go straight to the component parts of anything. And through that analysis, come to despise the thing itself. And the same method should be applied to the whole of life. So there's kind of two passages he makes of this. Uh, I think these are two really the best passages he makes about this idea of breaking things down into its component parts. And I think it kind of fits neatly into this. So I, I talked about this accumulative effect, but he talks about this deconstructive effect where if you want to introduce discomforts to your life, or you want to acknowledge something is unhealthy in your life, or something is bad for your life, or you you want to remove the comfort or you want to improve your life. He says, breaking it down and, and analyzing it into its component parts um, not only makes it easier, I think, especially in the second part, what he's trying to say is that it kind of um, makes it less intimidating, especially in the second part when he says, you, you come to despise the thing itself. I think that what he's really trying to say is that if you if you feel intimidated or you feel like it's too great of an obstacle to overcome by breaking it down into its component parts you then realize that each of those parts are pretty easy to get over i mean that's nothing that's nothing that's nothing oh wait that's the whole thing so the whole thing is really is really nothing to overcome um and i think this is a nice kind of i don't know if you would call it a corollary but a nice um counterpart to this idea of a cumulative effect of these discomforts helping support each other. Um, if you want to overcome a comfort, then breaking them out into its component parts also, also really helps. Yeah, I see these ideas as um, 
complimenting each other. Um, instead of uh, trying to take uh, uh, the thing as a whole, uh, you slowly add parts every time. Um, yeah. Yeah, I I uh, I tried uh, giving up uh, eating um, uh, chips uh, after uh, lunch uh, every day, and to replace uh, it uh, with uh, with carrots. Actually, I wanted to stop completely, but every time after lunch, I had this gnawing feeling that I need to snack, and by uh, going from uh, chips to uh, to carrots, from carrots to uh, snack uh, cucumbers. Um, it was really easy to just stop eating uh, snack uh, cucumbers. Um, because I don't know the the re reward is not as as big or as uh, overwhelming, like with. Uh, with chips, crisps, yeah. So breaking things down is a helpful uh, method. So um, there is a second part to analyzing his meditations. If nobody has any other comment or nobody wanted to bring up, um, and I, I'll leave this open to the floor just for a minute, just to see if anybody else has any other comment before I move on to another another question I wanted to ask. Um, is um, uh, Does anybody have any quote, passage, or mantra they want to take from his meditations, either in affirmation of something you would want to follow or kind of in an application of of what you could use in your life or in in contradiction to what you think would be ideal to helping you better yourself and if not i can i can move on yeah sure come let no act be done without a purpose nor otherwise than according to the perfect principles of art uh, intentionality I think is what I'm missing the most uh, from life. Um, finding a why to the action um, and then then performing the action. Um, just living from um, a moment to moment, um, I don't know, uh, feels like losing some of your uh, agency over your life. Um, uh, it's uh, from book four. I can can find the exact spot. Oh yeah, it's like really at the start of uh, book four. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's book four, two, right? Yeah, I see it. It, it looks different, but um, no action should be undertaken without aim. But it's the same, it's the same basic principle. Um, I also think this is quite nice to actually segue maybe into something I want to discuss. Um, which are the virtues? Um, something that we don't often bring up in a discussion. Um, but uh, and it's kind of awkward, as I just discussed, breaking something into its component parts. But you kind of made a good point that um, whatever component parts you break something into, 
maybe it's a, a giant task you have to surmount in the long run, but you break it up into steps they take, or it's some, an obstacle you have to get through, so you break it up into its parts to tackle. Um, it's um, easy to forget the forest through the trees. Um, that as much as you focus on the trees to as stepping stones to get to that forest, it's always good to meditate on the forest itself. Um, um, and um, he actually never, he mentioned this sometimes, he does meditate sometimes on the virtues exclusively, but often, often he doesn't do it exclusively. Often he just says something like actually in book, in that book uh, 11, um, two passage, he says, um, generally then, with the exception of virtue and its workings, and he continues to say breaking things down into its component parts. Um, but he often does things like that, where he kind of slides the virtues in um, and then lets them justify themselves. Um, but I think it's good that perhaps as a, as, as a stoic group, and we can debate this, if you don't think that the, the virtues are good enough as motivation, but I think as a stoic, if and I don't consider myself a perfect stoic, maybe more, I think most of us would consider ourselves eclectic, but um, uh, as a stoic, you would ideally always do something with the intention of becoming vir more virtuous, of of, a t of becoming more sage-like, of always trying to be more in accordance with the virtues um, of wisdom, courage, temperance, and um, justice. Um, and I think that's always something we need to have in context, that as much as we break things down into parts, as much as we um, practice stoicism and apply stoicism, that in in the long run, the game of stoicism is <clears throat> to reach the end of the virtues, to reach to reach the point at which you can consider yourself virtuous, which is for the stoic never. It's never, you're never at that point. The point is to always attain, always to work towards them. But um, I wonder if, do, would anybody, I'm having difficulty ask, asking the asking a couple of questions. One question I would ask is how what to what extent do the virtues have relevance in our modern society, and to what extent do they um, uh, are they exhaustive? Are they missing um, anything on on that short list of four virtues? Um, but the other question, which I, I may have a simple answer, um, because if we if we ask ourselves to always apply the virtues in daily life. But there's an alternative answer. Um, there's an alternative question that I wanted to ask about the virtues is um, uh, to what extent should we be meditating on the virtues? Um, to what extent should we not exhaust ourselves in ruminating on the virtues? Um, sometimes I feel like I'm in the trap of practicing kind because I'm never, I can't find myself in a good state, in a good balanced state where I'm at the same time Breaking, down, breaking things down into their parts, practicing little things like the dichotomy of control, uh, and at the same time, remembering the virtues and always always trying to reach them. Because I'm always in a week or in a month in that phase of, I gotta practice the dichotomy of control. I gotta look at my impressions. I have to do this or that. And then the next month I say, wait, I forgot about the virtues. I gotta meditate the virtues. And then I kind of switch back and forth and I've, I have found no perfect way to really um, be balanced in that respect, to kind of focus on the little obstacles and practices of stoicism and um, uh, also meditate on the virtues. Because as a stoic, I think it's good to remind ourselves that the, the virtues are the whole point of doing all these things. Um, but I think you're right. I think um, maybe a larger question maybe to your to, your, to to kind of answer your question with the question should come is are there any other motivations we can use in life other than the virtues that's not necessarily to the point of becoming more virtuous um are the virtues and a, a, a really the are really what motivates us let's stick to that question i know i asked a few questions in there but let's stick to that question it, are the virtues exhaustive? The Stoics like to say that they're exhaustive. Those are things in good in and of themselves and should be sufficient for action. But are they 
are they really like would you say in the short term or the long run something you you always hold up in high regard as saying that is something that i need to attain above all else or is there are there other motivations equally as important in your life um yeah no i i didn't think about it like that um until now um i don't see the virtues as motivating or um or driving um they can help find uh, the right action for, for me they they are more of a guidelines and helpful uh, reminders uh, when i face a new situation then i think what would be the the wise thing the courageous uh, thing to do i it's less um going about town looking for opportunities to be courageous um it's in 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 my um in my journey to find um my my own place in this tapestry of humanity's humanity's work and uh, and life in this universe um stuff can be very confusing um and having the virtues is really helpful to to you know collapse all the um, uh, possibilities into a tangible ac action actionable um uh, activities <laughs> actionable actions um because uh, well, I don't know, for me it's i'm coming to a new situation and uh, I can become really easily lost. What what can I do? It's a new situation. I never experienced it before. And I mean, we experience new things, new small things all the time. And even in those small things, a uh, you can become lost. And so, for me. It's more of a of a map, uh, and not uh, the engine. Just typing a um oh good um just typing something in here to share with you all. Uh, Tony. Uh, we can. You're on mute. You're still on mute. Yeah, wait. Is the uh, headphones muted or something? No, you're still on mute. I don't know. Did I mute you yeah. by accident? Maybe. Ah, here we go. OK. okay. Nice. Apologies. I think it's easy to become involved in the um, minutiae and the intricacies of our day-to-day -day lives. And that can become our focus if we're not careful. Um, but for me personally, um, the um, the beauty about thinking about wisdom, justice, courage, and temperance is that it takes us away and provides a wider perspective, almost sage-like perspective. Um, and whether this is exhaustive or not, I, I, I don't know, but I think every virtuous act um, by nature must be wise. Um, to some degree, so maybe it's it's not inexhaustive. It's 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 actually um, it's complete. Yeah, that would be my view. I wanted to share with you this. Um, this uh, this comes at the very end of um, book eleven. Um, so yeah, I. I 
I kind of agree. I, I would I would definitely say that to an extent, the list of these four virtues is exhaustive. So in, in this quote, he kind of basically characterizes justice. It's, this is basically what he's doing here is that he's basically giving a bit, a few different qualities of what justice really is. Um, he gives a few qualities like love of neighbor, truthfulness, integrity. Um, uh, he, he does says more, he does say more about justice in the rest of his meditations, but this is a good list of other virtues. And um, the reason why I mention this is because while it, and it, maybe we do find an example in the long run and we say this doesn't really categorize itself into one of the four virtues. But I think for me in practice, these four virtues are too broad. Like when I am, when it, it, they may be exhaustive, but in practice, I never want to ask myself, if I'm, am I being just? I want to ask myself, am I being honest? Am I being kind to, or compassionate to my neighbor? Am I being, um, Am I holding myself up to a high value? Am I um, um, not being a hypocrite? I think for me, while they may be exhaustive, I prefer to kind of break the um, in virtues into smaller parts. So I like to kind of maybe subdivide them into sub virtues almost, where like something like this is a good start, like love of neighbor, or truthfulness, integrity. Um, I would also include honesty or, or not being a hypocrite, things like that, that might um, come more easily because I'm trying to find something practical. Like, I think you're right. I think it's good to always ask in a specific action, like, am I being just, but then what does that mean? So I think breaking that down into like different characteristics always helps um, because in that situation, if I'm not being honest with that person or I'm not being, um, um, or from being a hypocrite, then that forces me to examine myself more and what I'm doing. Um, uh, yeah, I, I kind of actually, this is a nice, um, uh, something I've always wanted to do is um, because the question is always in my mind, like what other virtues are out there? And I think there are other virtues, but I think the point is that not to maybe add to the list, but to kind of, kind of make sets of virtues underneath these, these more encompassing four virtues. And they don't have to be the same for all of us. I think like for like as a group, the Berlin Stoics doesn't have to have a prescribed set of virtues under justice that we all follow. I think for each of us, like for me, I would like to have my own, like, what do I want out of justice? What does justice for me mean when I do, when I do something just? And then list what I would like to, what I would like to exhibit being a just person. And that to me means more than just being just. Um, just as just something I wanted to point out. Um, but I think that in practice, this would serve me better than just contemplating the virtues too broadly. Um, but you're right, to an extent, they're not, a, they're, they're, they're exhaustive, but I think to an extent, they're also non exhaustive in the way in which you apply them. I would always like to break them down, which I think Marcus Aurelius does. I think this shows that Marcus Aurelius knows that there are different components of justice and, and wisdom. Um, and I think he does this often. He does, he does break them down. Even in, um, didn't know if anybody was going to speak, but even integrity, like even integrity is too broad. Like for me, what does integrity mean? And I think it, it, it doesn't boil down too much into anything else, but things basic as basic as being honest and not being a hypocrite, especially the non-hypocritical part is basically what you mean by integrity. Do you, do you hold up to yourself to the values you want to show? And are you a hypocrite? Like those are the two things you want to sh make sure you, you satisfy is not being a hypocrite and holding up your values. Those are, those are what the definition of integrity for me are. are. And so, which then is being just so, um, but, um, I don't mean to make it seem like it's a, it's a checkbox. Like I have a box of tick marks and I say, this is, I'm doing this now and this now and this now. Um, I think it's just based on the situation context and um, uh, what is my girlfriend doing now? She's, um, uh, my girlfriend is right now um, in the process of examining closer her diet. And there's a good analogy I'm trying to make here. So this, I'm not talking about diet, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make the analogy to virtue where she's 
she got a new scale and she's um, trying to weigh all the food, all the different foods that she's eating and keep track of her, you know, calories, her different nutrients and things like this. And for me, that I, I understood the principle of having a variety of foods and having a variety of um, um, exercises in my diet and um, in order to be, be more healthy. But to be so precise, I think could be a bit disadvantageous um, because um, having a little bit of deviation from the perfect, the perfect normal of health to me might serve your body a little bit more just to help it. Um, and I'm not a nutritionist. Don't quote me on this, but I'm trying to make the analogy. That's my whole point is that um, uh, having that little deviation helps your body to kind of feel comfortable in a, in a room of uncertainty. Um, rather than if you're always at that level of perfection of, of being perfectly healthy, a little deviation could mean disastrous consequences for your body. Like it could basically mean like your body reacts very strongly to some deviation. And the point here I'm trying to make is that with virtues, um, trying to quantify with check marks, am I doing this virtue and that virtue? So I'm not, I would never try and do that. That's a bit too... Um, uh, that's microtasking too much. I would rather um, try and meditate on these subdivided virtues and which just help me then and there to practice them and apply them. Um, but quantifying them and categorizing them into which situation you use them is a bit too much. But at least, at least subdividing these virtues for me would help. Uh, actually, I like the uh, nutrition um, metaphor or connection. Um, you should uh, eat a variety. Um, so if you act uh, uh, only uh, on, on, on courage um, or if you eat only fats, I don't think uh, you live a very long life. Um, and I agree that uh, examining every single action uh, to such detail um, can be uh, tiring and can lead to decision paralysis, and it's not the best idea. But examine, examining your own ruling faculty and, and asking yourself, Am I heading in the right direction? Um, in in uh, in the general sense, is am I trying to follow these these virtues? Am I trying to become a better person? Um, I think this you know this very this very wide uh, definitions of virtues they fit for this scale. You can't use um, the really wide scale for every single action. So the, these wide uh, virtues are for guiding the direction of your life and then for judging uh, single actions. Yeah, you, I think uh, better, smaller, more um concise definitions like uh like the example say um you gave are way more helpful because uh to yeah to to act uh in temperance it's kind of a very wide very big uh to not uh eat uh uh i don't know uh, the whole bag of chips or the whole jar of cookies, it's a very understandable and definable act of temperance. So, yeah, I, I agree.
Um, he, um, he also remarks, this is not the first time he actually mentions the kind of purpose of philosophy. Um, I like this last sentence. He doesn't just define justice here. He also um, defines philosophy almost. It's kind of like a meta, early, early meta philosophy. Um, he says there is no, there is thus no difference between the true principle of philosophy and the principle of justice. He actually mentions philosophy really, really early in the book. He mentions philosophy in books one or two towards the end. Um, three. Uh, let me just try and track it. Yeah, he says this. Um, he says in book two, in 17, book two, 17. And he talks about, he's talking about the, the kind of ephemeral nature of life and time. And so kind of premeditating death. Um, and he, he says, what then can escort us on our way? What then can escort us on our path through life and to death? Um, he said, one thing and one thing only, philosophy. Um, this consists in keeping the divinity within us inviolate and free from harm, master of pleasure and pain, doing nothing without aim, truth, or integrity, and, and independent of others' action or failure to act. Um, it's interesting that I think Marcus Aurelius represents a very different kind of shift from Zeno. I think Zeno emphasized a lot of wisdom, uh, it emphasized the virtue of wisdom and um, and um, temperance in his philosophy. He uh, he understood the other two virtues, but he emphasized wisdom and temperance. And I think Marcus shifts that uh, emphasis from wisdom to justice. He does. I think Marcus Aurelius speaks more about justice in this book than wisdom. I think wisdom is always present in the idea of being rational and uh, you know thinking and acting in accordance with reason. But he kind of shifts the details to justice, especially when he says acting in accordance with integrity and truth and doing things with purpose, um, uh, being um, independent, being uh, doing things independent of others action or failure to act. He's always, he's always framing philosophy and the whole program of stoicism in, in the, in the virtue of justice, not wisdom. Just, uh, just a note I wanted to make, I thought, was quite interesting, um, which kind of fits the whole theme in a lot of the quotes we've been making about his idea that um, you should do things for the purpose of social action, of for the for the greater good for the whole. Um, to really like about about his work is that it kind of de egoizes stoicism, which is I guess why Ryan Holiday and a lot of authors when they read Marcus Aurelius take that away from him that they that they, they hope Marcus Aurelius tries to really de-emphasize the ego. And I think that's why he emphasizes justice so much in his, um, in his, when he emphasizes the virtuous in his book, that justice kind of comes on top, actually. Um, not necessarily less, more important than the other virtues, but just, just emphasized more here. His meditations is more of a socially proactive philosophy than the then even Zeno's, Zeno sounded always more interested in tackling himself. Um, and I think it took a few centuries after him to really develop into a more socially proactive philosophy that uh, Seneca or, or Marcus Aurelius had in mind. Yeah, Tony. Yeah, so I've noticed um, that there seems to be some similarities between um, the Stoic writings and Christianity and the New Testament. I'm just interested to know um, how much of Christianity did the likes of Marcus Reyes know about at the time? And were these principles which um, Stoicism and Christianity have in common, were they... Um, from what was the source of them? Was it the Christian writers or was it the Stoics? That maybe I have to defer to somebody else. <laughs> um, I know a very little still about the connections between Christianity and Stoicism. Um, all I can comment is that it doesn't seem like too much. 
only because, at least at the time of Marcus Aurelius, because at the time of Marcus Aurelius, it was still in the second century and um, early second century, like um, the um, uh, to mid to mid uh, second century. Um, and then he died in the late second century. So it was kind of in the in the middle of the second century Marcus Aurelius was living. And it that less than 200 years after Christianity began. And then the writings of Christianity took time. So I don't know if there's, at least back then, there was a big connection. But I think definitely it reads like a Bible also. The way in which it's cut up and the way in which the, the language is written. Um, yeah, but I'll, I'll let other, others speak because maybe they have more more knowledge of this, um, of how this book specifically affected Christian teachings. Um, yeah. Right. Um, I'm not a Christian. Uh, I know more about the Old Testament uh, than the New, although I, I read both. Uh, oh. Okay, Philip, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah, so uh, Stoicism uh, took a lot uh, from uh, Cynicism and uh, uh, Socrates, which predates uh, Christianity in like 300 years uh, and more. And a lot of this uh, type of uh, thinking uh, about virtues and uh, you know, living the good life comes from Socrates. Um, so I think um, the early Christians, uh, whose main language was uh, Greek, borrowed a lot, a lot uh, from Greek philosophy. That's like one part. The other part is that Stoicism was incredibly popular in Rome in the second in the second century um, and um, major a, a Christian um, power Catholic Church um, basically replaced the the Roman um, uh, religion and so i think <laughs> with within like very few generations people that practiced stoicism also practiced uh, christianity i can't remember when uh, constantine um, made the uh, christianity the official religion i think it was like 100 uh, 20 years after um, Marcus Ross died. I, I, I can. And also just a quick comment as you're searching quick, that's a good connection because um, the timing makes sense. Um, the, uh, the general consensus is that Stoicism <laughs> kind of won the favor of all the Roman politicians as like their philosophy in life. Um, especially after Seneca and Marcus Aurelius, it really became like a part of the Roman polit political ethos. And that I think makes perfect sense that then Constantine would choose Christianity because the philosophy started becoming very, almost resembled a lot of the elements of, of, of Stoicism. Um, there's, a, there's a passage here actually, if you look in book five, uh, passage six, um, uh, he talks about, hum yeah, I'll just summarize, he talks about being humble and not showing to others what the kindness that you're doing to others. So he talks about showing kindness to others, um, but he also talks about how you should do things privately. You shouldn't kind of be prideful about it. And this is something, and I, it's been years since I, I have read the Bible before. It's been years since I've read the Bible, but um when I read the Bible in the New Testament, G Jesus says something about um, uh, um, when you're um, when you're rich, don't show it. When you're when you're this, don't don't do that. Like don't. And there's that. I, I I wrote in here like a little note. This was a if this influenced this philosophy of Christianity. Um, 
So, or vice versa, if, you know, because Marcus Aurelius might have had knowledge of what the, the early followers had said, but um, yeah. Now, did you, um, what did you find? Uh, right, so um, Constantine declared the tolerance of uh, Christianity uh, in 313, Marcus died uh, 180. So, yeah, it's uh, quite a bit later. I mean, um, in Marcus's day, um, it was this weird sect that, that, that started um, gaining uh, popularity. Um, and he actually uh, talks about the stubbornness of Christians uh, in the meditations. That there's a there's a, a passage about it. Um, and in the height of the Antonine uh, uh, plague uh, that, that killed him, um, he kind of got into okay. I would say. I would say panic. Uh, he sacrificed Christians to the lions uh, in order to to appease the masses that were panicking. Um, you know, because the plague is, um, I would say, punishment for, from the gods and such. Um, so I would say he, he kind of lost uh, his just. Uh, and temperate uh, ways, but it's understandable. I mean, look what's going on there with a plague uh, outside. So, yeah. And we're still we're still blaming it on other people. Uh, yeah. This this whole um, in the United States, this whole um, the, the, these rise in hate crimes against uh, Asians because people think it's the Chinese fault. You know, we still have this. I don't know. After two after two millennia, we still have this weird. Um, at least, at least in some of the population, we still have this mentality that it, that somebody's to blame for something like this. Yeah. That it's, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Two things um, uh, about uh, blame. So, Marcus's son Commodus was one of the worst emperors in the history of the Roman Empire, like shoulder to shoulder with uh, Neron and and the such. And I'm not saying it's it's Marcus's fault. Uh, his son's behavior is not under his control. Um, but I think uh, I think we can talk about education and stoicism, uh, raising uh, kids and stoicism. I think that could be a good um, good topic. Um, and I wanted uh, to share a, a play by um, a Lucian of uh, Samosata um, about uh, it's called uh, the sale of uh, creeds or the auction of uh, philosophies. It's basically uh, he, he lived the same time as, uh, uh, as Marcus Aurelius um, and wrote about the you know the popular philosophies of the day uh, coming. Um, being sold at an at an auction uh, by uh, Zeus and uh, and um, Hermes uh, Hermes I don't know how to call it, say it in uh, English doesn't matter Hermes we yeah. say but I, I don't know if Hermes. that's American English yeah anyway the um, uh, the way he writes about uh, um, the skeptics and the, the cynics uh, it's really funny. And there is actually quite a bit um, about the, the Stoics. Um, and I don't know, I found it amusing. 
um, and it really bought like a new perspective on philosophy because in these days it was like like live in the streets people were debating uh, lecturing uh, and it was a kind of entertainment um, and yeah the, the stories about Marcus Ruiz um, dressing up uh, as a civilian and going to listen to a uh, philosophy lectures and I know this kind of satirical play uh, really brought it to life uh, for me could you um could you share the uh, which play is it a uh, sale of quid I linked it in uh, the discussion uh, uh, group on telegram oh okay okay um no, yeah, I have to read it because uh, it'd be interesting to see the the, the satire um, of stoicism and cynicism. Um, it's uh, it's always it's always fun to see the absurdity and how people present them, even how they present themselves, because um, we know the the um, the usual characteristics attributed to cynics and stoics, um, the cynics who have sex in the streets, and the stoics who don't show emotion. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, it started uh, back then, uh, like in, in the play, uh, um, Diogenes uh, is um, being uh, like, you know, brought on, on the uh, on the podium and the buyer is like, is it, is it safer like, to, to approach him? Wouldn't he like snarl and, uh, and bite me? Because <laughs> he's a dog. <laughs> um, Anyway, the uh, Lucian of uh, Samosata uh, is was a, a, a Stirkin and like traveling teacher, and uh, he basically gave lectures uh, in the streets and uh, in the House of Nobles uh, for the kids, and I see it as one of the best ways to to pass like material to uh, to the listeners because you, you know it's a, you do learn about philosophy about the like major principles of of the philosophies but in a funny um in, in a funny um, and very um how to say uh, easy to com communicate way. So, yeah, one of the best. <laughs> yeah, I'll check it out. Um, it's um, it's interesting you mentioned that the, it's um. I think I mean of of course if they were living today they would I think succumb to this some of the same uh, entertainment luxuries that we find sometimes we watch a movie on netflix sometimes we um uh listen to eh, heavy metal and um while we while we do some chore around the house like so i think i think they would succumb to this some of the same luxuries which are not all necessarily bad but i think it's um it's it's some ways a bit tragic that some of the um uh, um some a lot of people don't take part in some of these traditional entertainment uh, entertaining comforts that we find, like in listening to lectures or watching plays on, on these kind of themes, which I think actually, I think what, what is filling the void for that are things like podcasts. It's funny that I a whole start, started this whole thing talking about the Stoic psychologist or some other podcasts, but really podcasts are kind of a, a new way. There, there's, there's definitely some other medium, like media, like some documentaries or, or movies on Netflix or something or some channels you watch on YouTube who um, YouTube uh, persona who make video essays on philosophies or things like this are kind of trying to break that barrier and make more of an inner in it doing its own niche entertainment industry this knowledge 
Um, I also wanted to post in the discussion chat, if you see this discussion chat, the Stoic Mom. So relating back to your idea that we have a, we, we have a, um, a, dis, a, we delve deep into a discussion on Stoicism and parenting. Um, this is the Stoic Mom. This is a nice blog about a, um, uh, started by a mother in California who, Meredith Kuntz, who um, tries to apply philosophy to uh, philo the philosophy of stoicism to parenting to not only help parent their her kids but to help her herself as a parent um and um i know a dan stoic dan who's been here a couple of times the last time he was on here um he also mentioned a couple of names um which i have to i have to dig up in the, in the notes i took for the meeting um so there's definitely a lot of material out there between in, in Stoic Stoicism and parenting, which would be pretty interesting. Um, that could be one of the um, one of the first um, meetups we have when we when we return. Um, so, when I return, um, there will be, I think, maybe three or four meetups in the first two weeks to start off. There will be a introductory presentation and Q and A on Stoicism for beginners. Uh, and then there will be um, maybe maybe three, but possibly just two to begin with for anybody in the in this intermediate level. Um, in one case, we can have something academic, which I, I thought might be good to kind of might be interesting to look at and compare the cynics and Stoics. Um, but we could definitely start off with parenting. I think that's a lot better in terms of the um, in terms of doing something applied. Um, I didn't want to do something solely based on text, but I mean, there, I think there's no way about it around it that if we want to practice and learn more about stoicism, we have to read a little bit about it. Um, and I think this blog is a really good start. Um, I also wanted to do a workshop. I was thinking about doing a workshop on stoic virtues, and we could do something a little bit like this, where we can help contemplate on um, the virtues. And what I thought we could do is apply something that I wanted to do here and apply it into a workshop where I help um, guide a kind of practice. I can help myself model over the next two weeks to do it myself and help each of us um, um, guide ourselves by meditating on what the virtues mean for us, um, not only in listing out sub-virtues, but kind of um, giving ourselves examples of how we can apply in our own, or, or in our own lives um, in that respect. Um, so we can have both a workshop and uh, a meetup on parenting and stoicism in the first week, which I think, think would be interesting. I don't think we're, I think these two basic levels, one's for beginners, one's for intermediate level stoic members are good enough. I don't think any of us are at a level where we can really dive deep into any kind of higher academic um, study of it, but, um, but yeah. Um, so Saturday the 1st, no, Saturday the 8th of May is when, um, when we can resume our usual Stoic meetings. Um, that will not be the day when, we, when I do my, my, beginning, my beginner introductory presentation on Stoicism. So May the 8th is when we can resume, we can um, do a discussion on parenting and Stoicism. And then I have to plan out the other, the other meetups I wanted to do um, for, the, for, the, for the group. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention just before I end, I know I know it's really late, but the, the last thing I wanted to mention is that I'm going to add a page to the, to the website about donations. Um, they do not have to be big. The thing is, is that for what people don't know is that um, not only do I pay uh, a little bit every year for the website in terms of the Wix account and the domain name, I also pay yearly about 40, I forget the exact figure, it's 45 euros uh, a year for the meetup group. Um, there is a fee you have to pay to meet up to actually be an administrator and organize groups. Um, so I will be just adding a donations page. So this is my this is my time to just ask um, uh, if you're willing um, when the donations page goes up and I'll contact you in the next week about it um, just to notify everybody. If you can make a one to five euro donation um, please. Uh, and I'll keep track of it. So I'll keep everybody updated about how the donations are going. Um, because I also don't want um, donations to just roll in because I really don't need all the donations in the world, just enough to kind of help pay for these, um, uh, these small fees every year. So uh, Tony, yeah. Yeah, just one quick thing. Um, 
reached out to Donald Robertson um, on um, Instagram, and he has, in principle, um, said that he'd attend a meeting at some point over the next few weeks. Um, maybe not for the full duration, but um, I know that he's quite a prominent figure, and I like his writings. Um, so I'll just keep you informed on that. He may attend at some point. I'm still in the I'm still in the trying to persuade him stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, he's, yeah, he's a good guy. He seems like really down to earth and stuff. So we've, we've we've had a good little discussion, and in principle, he said yes. Anyway, so I'll let you know. That'd be great. Um, I think uh, I don't want to um, because he's such a whole high high profile figure. Um, not because he's a high profile figure, but because he knows so much about stoicism and because he's done this a lot. I think if he ever does attend a meetup and maybe he's listening now, <laughs> but um, if he happens upon the streaming link, but um, uh, the thing is, is that um, I don't want it to be a typical discussion like this. I don't want him to participate in something like this where he just knows too much. He's more of a person at this point where he could he could give a Q&A to us or we can ask him to discuss a topic and we can kind of, or we can, as a group, we can interview him. We can like submit questions as a group and we can interview him on a, on a particular theme or topic in stoicism that we would like to discuss. That is also possible. So, but, but I think it would have to be differently formatted than the usual discussions we have just because of the nature of the figure he is. I don't think he would find it um, basically stimulating to have a, a yeah. very, for him, a low level, low level discussion like this. Yeah. I think I mean, we um, if we ask him. Sure. I mean, I've, I've mooted a 10 minute Q&A. Uh, um, so I'll see what he comes back with. He hasn't responded yet. Um, but I think a Q&A would be a good way forward for him. Um, but as I say, he just seems like a cool guy and you know, very sort of willing to assist and to, to participate. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. No, thank you for the proactivity too. Of contacting him um, because I'm out on social media. Somebody else has to do it. <laughs> well, it's, to, it's to my wife. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's great. Um, uh, wow, that, that just brings me to uh, just an announcement, not about the Berlin Stoics, but if anybody's interested, um, there's a couple of uh, general Stoic events happening um, tomorrow. Um, on Sunday, this is at six o'clock tomorrow, but six o'clock um, Eastern time. So I believe that's for the US, Eastern time US. So Central East, I don't know what CEST is. Uh, um, Central European. Central European time, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm used to the to the EST, but that's, um, uh, so that's our time. So that's um, 12 EST, uh, so six our time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sunday, um, six our time um, is the Marcus Aurelius anniversary conference. Um, you can find the link on the Modern Stoicism Eventbrite webpage here. Uh, they have other events coming up. So that's the first event. That's tomorrow in honor of Marcus Aurelius. It's a virtual conference. Um, they also have a few others coming in the pipeline. They have in on May fifteenth. They have one on a Stoicon X. So it's not the main Stoicon, but it's Stoicon on a military conference on these virtues of courage, honor, and stoicism. And then on June 5th, um, a Stoicon X conference on women in stoicism. Um, I'm not sure I didn't read, uh, but I believe that's simultaneously both probably a, a, a Stoicon X on the Stoics, on the women who have contributed to the stoicism in the past. So women prominent in stoicism, but also how how stoicism can help women because it is traditionally seen as a, as a male thing, which I think also the Stoic, on the Stoic Mom blog, um, she also mentions that she wants to, um, uh, the whole the point is not just about parenting. The whole point is uh, it's good to kind of break these barriers that stoicism is male centric. I think it's really good that you have women participating, especially in, in the, especially as, a, as, a, as an applied field of philosophy where many, um, uh, many wouldn't naturally come to stoicism if it was if it stayed in this theoretical ivory tower they come mm -hmm. to stoicism because of its applied applied practicality um so okay. those are the only announcements i had um and thank you tony for for um letting okay. us know uh so i'll uh 
make sure I update everybody about anything that comes along the way. And I will see everybody on May 8th at 4 o'clock. So, right. Cheers, guys. Cheers, everybody. Have a, see, you. see you in a couple of weeks.